Well, today we're gonna look at one more story in the book of Genesis. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. And this is a story about God intervening, stopping people from a massive and misguided building project. So here's the underlying issue. Instead of obeying God's command to fill the earth, to reproduce God's heart and intentions in the world, the people ignored God and they did things their own way. So based on where we've been in this series, does that sound familiar? People ignoring God and doing things their own way? Well, the good news is this. Despite our tendency to ignore God, he never gives up on us. God never gives up on us. Not only does God desire a restored relationship with us, he wants to use us to express his heart and intentions throughout the world because we are critical to God's plan. We are critical to God's plan. Before we dive into the scripture, I'd love to just pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, God, and we thank you for just the opportunity to be in this place, to be with others who are looking to you for guidance in our lives and, and the things that you have for us. Lord, I pray that in this time and in this space, Lord, that you would give us a clearer picture of who you are, that you would expand our understanding of you. Lord, I also pray that you would help us to see ourselves as we are. But I also pray, Lord, that you would help give us a vision of who we can be and that you would give us the courage to step into the places that you have called us to step into. So Lord, I pray right now that you would give us your eyes to see, that you would give us your ears to hear, and that you would give us your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're looking at Genesis 11, and we're gonna look at verses one through nine. So I would encourage you, grab the house Bibles uh, under the seats in front of you, or if you have the app on your mobile device, I'd encourage you to go ahead and pull that up, because really the rest of this morning we're gonna spend in the text. And so it's gonna be really important that you're reading along as I'm talking through this passage. So as we're moving to that, what I wanna do is kinda of give you a context. Let's set the stage on where we are in the story of God, okay? So last week, we talked about the flood, and so we are post-flood, and we're in the process of the earth being repopulated, as Barry shared with us last week. So in Genesis 10, if you were to look at Genesis 10, what you would see is a description of what the world was like at that point in time. There are three times in Genesis 10 that Moses lays out this picture, this description of the world. You'll see it in verse 5 of chapter 10 where it says, Their descendants, Noah's descendants, spread out to various lands, each identified by its own language, clan, and national identity. So he's declaring what is true in that very moment. And then in Genesis 11, he's gonna go back and he's gonna tell us how we got to this place. And so this week, like really many other weeks that we've looked at, there tends to be not a ton of details related to what happened or how it all happened. So we kind of sit here and there are things that we have to imagine. There are parts that we have to imagine maybe what happened in this setting. But that's really okay because Moses' main point here is he wants us to see why what happened happened. He wants us to see who God is and he wants us to see who we are. So we're much more interested in why this happened and then the result of what happened. So remember the Israelites or the original audience and they are wandering around the wilderness and they're wandering in the desert and they are completely dependent on God. So God shows up each day, he gives them manna, and that's enough for this, to sustain them for that day, and then the next day, he gives them more manna for that day. He even warns them, do not store up, trust me, because tomorrow there's gonna be enough for you. So they're wandering around, there's about a million of them, and there are already various tribes and different groups of people, and what they know is that their current situation their current situation and their history has been there are tons of difficulties and divisions among the tribes and among the groups of people 
It's been their story forever. And so what they're experiencing is a far cry from Genesis 1 and 2, from God's original intentions and his heart for humanity and for our earth. And so their question is, why is the world like it is? I have to admit, that is often my question. Like, why is the world that the way it is today? I think this text helps us get to a better understanding of why that is. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to read the passage, the whole thing, at one time. It's only nine verses, so it won't take too long. And then we're going to go back, and we're going to look at some verses and see what we can discover in those passages. So let's go ahead and read the passage and see uh, the overall story. Chapter 11, verse 1. says, At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia, and they settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. So let's look at the first two verses in that passage, uh, verse 1 and 2. And I want us to look at three different things that we can find in those very first verses. The first thing I want to talk about is this idea of language, this idea of them speaking one language. At that point, in that context, everyone was able to understand each other. There were absolutely no language barriers among the people. So why is this an important point for him to make at the beginning? What we know about language is we understand that language has the ability to unify us. It unifies people around a common cause. We just heard about that through some of the stories that Amy shared, some of the things that are possible because of the generosity of our community of grace. What can be accomplished when we come together, we join forces in order to bring about God's kingdom here in our world. There is strength in numbers, and people tend to cluster or join around people who are like them. You've heard that phrase, we speak the same language. We speak the same language, meaning not only can we understand each other, but we also agree with each other, right? So we tend to like to hang out with people that we speak the same language with. It's easier. There's less tension. There's less conflict. There's less debate, if you will. A shared language brings people together because it has power and it moves people toward action. So that doesn't necessarily sound like a bad thing, right? That kind of sounds like a good thing. They have one language and they're able to move plans forward. The problem was how they were using this one language. The problem was what they were doing with their ability to communicate with each other. The second thing I want to look at in that first two verses is this idea of migrating to the east. So in the ancient world, any time that we hear that someone is moving to the east, what that means is that they're moving away from God's will and his intentions and his presence. They are moving away from what God intended. So Moses, remember, the original hearers are listening to him or reading this thinking, what is happening is not according to God's will. They're moving to the east. The third thing that you see at the very end of chapter 2 is that they found a place and they settled there. Remember Genesis 1 and 2. Mankind has a job to do. Do you remember that from Genesis 1? 
God gave man and woman a job to do. He called them, he called us to be his image bearers, to be his representatives in this world. In Genesis 1.28, it actually says that he, he calls Adam and Eve to fill the earth, to, to populate the earth with God's heart and intentions. And then after the flood, he also tells Noah the very same thing to fill the earth in Genesis 9-1. Settling in this place was in direct opposition of what God had instructed. By settling, by finding a place, finding this comfortable place where they felt like everything they needed was there for them, they decide to stay and they lose track of what God has called them to do. So let's keep going, let's see what else happens. In verses three and four, it says, they began to say to each other, let us make bricks and harden them with fire. Then they said, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. So what is this about? What is this bricks and mortar that he's talking about? In that place and in that time, bricks and mortar were believed to be a better substance for building. They were believed to last longer. If they would have chosen stone, which would have required them to go far away and to go to, and to quarry stone and bring it back, that would have been more difficult and would have potentially even cost more. But the idea here is if they're building with bricks and, and mortar, which we find out they're using tar, was so that it could be indestructible. The tar that they mentioned really was waterproof. So together, they initiate this community-wide building project that would have taken them years and years to build. So I imagine they're in this building project, they're communicating clearly with each other, and the more they're building, the more their idea of who God is, who they are, and their responsibility to others becomes more and more ingrained in who they are and what they're doing it for. This city that they talk about building with the bricks and mortar, a city would have given the idea of strength and, st and stability and security to the people who lived there, to the inhabitants. Cities could have included things like a temple or a place of worshiping God. It could have included things like a grain storage facilities for their food so they could store up their harvest to provide for themselves in the days ahead. And a city would have been surrounded by walls to protect the people from outsiders. To protect them from outsiders. The point is this. They believed what they were building with their own hands would be indestructible and it would provide everything they needed to survive and even thrive. So then there's this tower that they're also building. This tower would have been considered a ziggurat. A ziggurat is a tower that was built because the people believed that the gods would use it to actually come down from the sky where they thought they, they lived. And they would come down in order to receive worship and gifts from the people in order to appease the gods so that they could get the things that they needed so that they could in some way, really control and somewhat manipulate the gods. Imagine it this way. It's kind of a pyramid-shaped structure with a stairway for the gods to come down. Now, if you're in the ancient world, just that phrase that the gods came down would strike fear in you because the only reason that a god would come down would be because they were upset with what the people were doing. So if you're the Israelites and you're hearing this, that the gods came down, you would again say, this is not a good thing. The problem is the tower they're building has nothing to do with exalting God and worshiping God. What it says is that this will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. It was this idea, if we build this, we're gonna get the reputation for this. We're gonna become famous. And it's gonna keep us from being scattered across the world. It was about themselves, not about God. So if we're to review what we've seen so far in this story, 
Their ability to communicate with one language allowed them to work together. It allowed them to work alongside each other. But instead of being in sync with God, they disobeyed his command to go and fill the earth. They were not interested in being God's representatives in the world. They were comfortable right where they were. And actually, they liked the people they were with. So they decided, let's just settle here. This place is great for us. What they were attempting to build had absolutely nothing to do with honoring God and exalting his name. It was all about making a name for themselves. So what does God do? God stops them and he redirects their misguided steps. He stops them and he redirects their misguided steps. I can tell you, it's easy to get off track. I get off track and I am so grateful that God stops me and he readjusts my focus and he puts me back on the path that he has for me. God never gives up on us. In verse five and six, his response is this. It says, but the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. He says, look, he said, the people are united. They all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. God looks at what they've built and he is not impressed. He's not impressed. In fact, in the ancient world, he, would have, he came down because they would have known that he wasn't impressed and he was upset. Remember, God does not have to come down. God is well aware of what is happening in the moment. He's seen it all along. And this line that says, uh, verse, that says that th once they do this, after this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them, makes it sound like he has some concern over what humanity can do. The truth is God is not worried about our ingenuity or our capabilities. We are finite. We're limited. He is infinite and he is unlimited. He is the one who helps us make advances. He's the one who helps us make discoveries. He's the one who gives us technology and science and the knowledge to make advancements because all knowledge is God-given. Our advances, our ability to move things to a better place or to understand and to, to make advances can do one of two things. It can either move us to a place of feeling like we are self-sufficient, that we don't need anyone or anything, and that can move us to arrogance and pride, and it can puff us up. Or it can move us to this place of realizing that everything is a gift from God, that our advances and our technology and our knowledge is actually God-given which in turn can move us to this place of worship and gratitude to God as our creator and our sustainer. So instead of letting this line of thinking in this way of living continue in our story, God saves them from themselves. He gets their attention and redirects their focus so that they can fulfill their role as God's representatives in the world. How does he do it? In verse seven and eight, it says, come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. God confuses their language so that they are scattered all over the world. The original intention to go out and carry God with them. God confused their language because their hearts were not in sync with his. That's why he confuses their language, because their hearts were not in sync with his. And the result is they're scattered out into the world so they can be God's representatives. So in this story, in the story of Babel, God pushes the people out to fill the earth with his vast love. But that's only part of the story. 
That's where we end in Genesis here. But I feel like we can't stop there. I feel like we've got to look at just a little bit more of God's story so that we can see a clearer picture of God's heart and intentions for our world. You see, some of Jesus' very last words help us understand God's heart and intention for us and how he is making all things new. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, here are the words that he gives us. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and through the Holy Spirit's power in you, you will be witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What he's saying is, when I go back to be with the Father, I will send the Holy Spirit to live in you. And as the Holy Spirit lives in you, that will give you the power to be my witnesses here where you live, in your neighborhood, in the community beside you, in the state, in the nation, all the way throughout the world. He's calling them, calling us to go out and be his representatives in this world, to carry his heart and his intention beyond these borders, beyond these walls. But there's more to the story. So right after Acts 1-8, if we look at chapter 2 of Acts, which we can't do this morning because I don't have time to do it, but I want to tell you what happens in Acts 2. In Acts 2, a miracle happens. Instead of language dividing and causing confusion, the Holy Spirit enabled each person each nationality to hear the message of God in their own language. The gathering was very diverse. There were all kinds of different languages being spoken. But the point that's being made in Acts 2 is miraculously, everyone could understand, even though they all spoke different languages. What happened in Acts 2 is evidence of God's continued healing and redemptive work. It is a foretaste of what will be someday when Jesus returns. Where regardless of language, we understand each other. We speak the same language because we speak God's language. And that unites us. A little bit further along in the story, if we were, had time, we'd go to Revelation. And we'd look at a couple of passages and we'd see this vision that John, one of the disciples, has of what will be someday when Jesus Christ returns. And how he describes that speaks of God's heart and intention for our world today and what will be someday. He says this, every tribe and language and people and nation will stand together worshiping. Every tribe and language and people and nation will stand together worshiping. Reunited, full of color. Full of color and full of diversity. Fully expressing the vast love and nature of God. Can you imagine such a day? That we will see more clearly who God is. How large he is. How magnificent he is because there's so much diversity and there's so much color and beauty. God desires a diverse world where language and culture do not divide, but serve to reveal the vast love of God. God desires a diverse world where language and culture do not divide, but serve to reveal the vast love of God. So what is God's plan to bring this about? How's he going to accomplish this? His plan is us. We are the plan. God has great confidence in us when our hearts are in tune with his. We are critical to God's plan. But let's be honest. It is easier to settle than to scatter. It is easier to stay in familiar territory. It is easier to surround ourselves with people who are just like us. To be with people that we understand and that we agree with than to venture out into the uncomfortable place of diversity. It's easier to ignore God and build our own kingdoms. 
It is easier to ignore God and build our own kingdoms. But that is not God's intention for us or for our world. Not only does God desire a restored relationship with us, he wants to use us to express his heart and intentions to everyone, everywhere, because we are critical to God's plan. You see, God is inviting us into a new way of life. He is inviting us to have our desires be his desires, to have our actions represent his actions in our world. Just yesterday, I was looking at an article in Christianity Today, and I think it summarizes where we've been in this series really well, and so I wanna share that with you. It says, Christians believe that the world is profoundly broken. Christians believe that the world is profoundly broken. If we just look around in our families, in our communities, in our state, in our nation, and worldwide, I don't think we can debate that question. The world is broken. But we also believe that God is actively redeeming it. We believe that God is actively redeeming the broken places in our world. And we believe that we are part of the process. We are part of the process. The quote continues, living in this tension means having a clear-eyed view of the world as it is, seeing the world as it is, while simultaneously envisioning what could be. Simultaneously envisioning what could be. What would it be like if we were all working toward the vision that John has in Revelation? If we all came together in this community and we began to build that kind of life, we began to build that kind of heart like God's. Every tribe, every nation, every language reunited, worshiping God. I would love to have that day. What a day of celebration that would be. God has great confidence in us when our hearts are in tune with his. That's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for me. I am critical to God's plan. You are critical to God's plan. We are critical to God's plan. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is true for the original hearers and it's true for us. That we can look at an ancient story and we can see more clearly who you are and we can see more clearly who we are. Lord, I thank you that the story doesn't end in Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. That you even give us a picture of what you desire to be true someday through a vision that you gave John. Lord, I pray for this body, I pray for this church, I pray for us, that we would move into the places that you are calling us to that we would be brave and courageous and bold and willing to be uncomfortable. And Lord, I know as we do that, as we lean into you and we lean into each other, that we will see more clearly who you are. And that image will be so much brighter and more beautiful than we have ever imagined. Lord, we surrender to you. We want that. Lord, would you allow your spirit to make that possible? In Jesus' name, amen.